Welcome to episode 49 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. Our topic of focus for today is wellness myths in the yoga world. And if you are kind of a regular listener to our podcast, you're probably familiar with the fact that Travis and I tend to focus on a lot of topics that surround things like movement, biomechanics, alignment, pain, and of course, the inevitable kind of myths and misinformation that arise in that realm. So that's kind of like our forte and our specialty. But in addition to like biomechanics and movement, maybe myths and misinformation, there, there's, there's a lot of other and additional like claims and things that we tend to hear in the yoga world. And where we kind of want to turn our focus today is this larger realm of health claims. We uh, tend to come across many different health claims that may, might come across our radar in the yoga world. And oftentimes these claims might be themselves myths and misinformation. So the yoga world in general is kind of adjacent to something called the wellness industry. Uh, and there's definitely some overlap between the two. And we are going to define what the wellness industry is as we get into this episode today. But um, many yoga practitioners tend to already be just kind of familiar with the concept of the wellness industry, what that looks like, maybe some wellness influencers they may have come across like online or on social media. And also because there is some overlap between the two, uh, there are quite a few like yoga teacher and yoga influencers who also kind of do double time as wellness influencers. So I tend to see that quite a bit. So the word wellness, like as a concept, it might sound good on the surface, but the wellness industry itself is actually an industry that, do, that is kind of full of quite a bit of misinformation and some myths. And those are kind of what we wanted to focus on today. The um, wellness industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. So it's definitely like has a big presence out there and it is distinct from conventional medicine. And we also kind of will talk about the difference between those two. So Travis and I wanted to focus on wellness myths today um, for a few reasons. First of all, just to kind of raise awareness of the prevalence of these myths. And then as always, just with our podcast in general, we hope to help improve like just collectively our whole community's scientific thinking and critical thinking skills, scientific literacy in general. And overall, just helping all of us to better spot BS when we see it. So with all of that said, in order to look at this big topic today, we have invited on two very special guests that we are super excited to have here with us. Today, we have Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And the two of them are the co-hosts and the founders, the co-founders of something called the Unbiased Science Podcast. And this is a super important podcast that does an amazing job of really debunking so many of these widespread health claims and health misinformation and disinformation and um, a lot of insights, uh, information out there that can kind of lead us astray. And in addition to their podcast, uh, Jessica and Andrea also share uh, really resourceful infographics across social media channels. And so those are very helpful as well. And uh, Jessica is a public health expert and a data scientist. And Andrea is an immunologist and a microbiologist. So the two of them are really like a much needed powerhouse of credible science-based information. And Travis and I are just major fans of their work. We are really excited to have them here today. Uh, and let's see, just for our audience to start to get to know the two of you a bit, this first question will really be for both of you, but we might, let's say we'll start with, with Jess. And so the first question, Jess, is just, could you tell us a bit about your background and about your expertise that like you bring to the Unbiased Science Podcast? 
Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having us. We're really excited. And this is such an important conversation. And I, there's definitely intersection between uh, the work that mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, so as you said, I'm a public health scientist. Public health is a very broad umbrella term for a lot of different things. So I have expertise in stuff like data analysis, uh, biostatistics, epidemiology, health policy evaluation, research design, and that kind of stuff. Stuff. Um, and so I am an expert in collecting data, analyzing data, and turning data into meaningful information. Um, and so the way that's relevant to the work that Andrea and I are doing um, is that I'm able to, to critically appraise the 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 information that is being disseminated. And, and as I'm sure we'll talk about, there's a whole lot of, and you already said it, misinformation, disinformation, and then malinformation out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, with, with my background, I'm able to really assess the validity, the reliability of the studies out there. Um, and something that I'm quite sure that we're going to talk about is um, how people will take things out of context or we'll take a study that's done in a Petri dish and then apply that to humans or generalize that to humans. So I'll put a pin in that because for sure we're going to come back to that and I'll turn things over to Andrea. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm a, med I'm a biomedical scientist. Um, so I really am looking at, you know, the, how the immune system, I, Zara's bananas today. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so really anything related to the immune system, which means really anything related to our bodies, because the immune system is probably the most complex organ system and it touches every other organ system. And, and really every bodily process in our in our bodies. So, you know, that's related to infectious diseases. That's where kind of the microbiology arm comes in. Um, so, you know, bacterial infections, viral infections, parasitic infections, um, vaccines, obviously, um, but mm -hmm. also things like cancer and autoimmunity and allergies. Um, but even things that you might not even think of, like every time you exercise, you experience micro tears in your muscles and your immune system implements wound healing processes to make sure that that damage is, is you know, constrained and, and is healed. And so you can have recovery and then exercise again. And, and when you digest foods, your immune system is, is involved in that both for, um, you know, um, sensing that it's not supposed to respond to things and react inappropriately to them. And it also helps educate your immune system when you eat certain things. Um, and, and, because it's really involved in so many bodily processes, it's it's a very common target for a lot of this kind of wellness pseudoscience. Um, so, you know, coming from a research space, um, really to kind of a, a an educational space with my background. That is so excellent and so relevant. And thank you for uh, highlighting just kind of the important and really very integrative role that the immune system plays in the body. I think sometimes just on a very superficial level, we just hear immune system and just think like, that's just when you're sick. Some, but yeah. you just yeah. really describe how it's like, yeah. yeah. It's involved, involved in, in everything. Stuff. I mean, it's, yeah. it's involved in the development of obesity. It's involved in sleep mm -hmm. patterns. It's literally involved in everything. Yeah. So... So true. So clearly the two of you just have very, very symbiotic, complementary uh, expertise that you bring to what you do. And I just, I personally, as a consumer of your content, I really appreciate how you are able to just kind of dilute and, or I don't know if dilute is the best word, but like translate some of this like high, high end and sophisticated knowledge into terms that everyday people can understand and make meaningful and, and relevant. So now that we have a bit of an understanding of where you two are, have kind of come from in your backgrounds with your uh, with your work together, could you, and I know really either of you could answer this question, so it's just kind of whoever wants to like maybe jump in, but let us know just a bit about like why you decided to start the Unbiased Science Podcast and your work with the infographics and like what was the motivation? So Andrea and I were, we met at Stony Brook University as undergrads. Um, and so we both, obviously, after we graduated, we kept in touch. And as we've sort of explained, um, and as you beautifully summarized, we have these different but symbiotic, um, you know, mm -hmm. areas of expertise. So Andrea is this biomedical scientist, scientist really focused on 
the the processes in our bodies, right? Um, whereas I'm big picture population health. And so it's just, it's very complementary. We also have different communication styles, personalities, perspectives, backgrounds. I, I always say, you know, I grew up in South Brooklyn. My dad didn't graduate high school. My mom was first generation American. Um, Andrea grew up in you always laugh when I say this, but the woods of rural Connecticut, um, you know, playing in the mud, getting Giardia, um, you know, we just had very, very, very different backgrounds that have sort of, um, you know, uh, influenced where we are today. And so we we kept in touch over the years. And when I became a mom in 2016, I was horrified by the misinformation that I was seeing in the mom groups, uh, primarily yes. on Facebook primarily surrounding vaccines. And so Andrea and I and Andrea had been dealing with, the, you know, similar, not not in the mom groups, but on a professional level and in, in her work as an immunologist dealing with misinformation. And so, you know, we always had this idea, we should do something, right? Like we have something to say, we should do something, but life, work, family, everything happened until the pandemic hit. And mm -hmm. that's when we realized that no one knew, everyone was terrified. We were all trying to make sense of what was happening in the world, you know, science by headline, preprints being taken out of context and being splashed all over the media. And so our um, networks of friends and family were turning to us. And so we were like, all right, let's just hop. We realized we were both doing it. So let's do an Instagram live, a Facebook live. And the feedback was so overwhelmingly positive. It was, wow, you have something really special here. There's chemistry and your, um, you know, your different perspectives as scientists is really, you know, you're, you're providing a very comprehensive coverage of these topics. And so that's when Unbiased Science was born. You know, it was this, we felt this moral imperative to help people make sense of, of the world. And then things have really evolved. We're no longer just tackling COVID or COVID vaccines. We're tackling a variety of topics from the foods that we eat, you know, m misinformation about GMOs and organic foods. And I mean, you name it, Lyme disease, which is uh, Andrea's expertise. She's the executive director of the American Lyme Disease Foundation. Just so much. There's so much out there that we yes. that we want to address. And so the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, is that <laughs> we understand that people consume information in different ways. And so for some people, they like mm -hmm. listening to a podcast. For others, it's short video reels on Instagram. For others, it's long form posts. And for others, it's infographics. And sometimes we're playful. Sometimes we're snarky. Sometimes we <laughs> have pop culture references. Sometimes we're more serious and didactic. And so we play with a lot of different messaging techniques and modalities to try to inform the public. It's so cool that you were like the podcast was born out of necessity almost. It's like, let, not like we were it. any less busy during the pandemic. Just we were like, there's never going to be a good time for this. Yeah, no, there's never a good time to start a podcast. But like you all pulled your resources. And then it like you said, it turned out you had something really that really resonated with people. And oh, it turns out there's a lot more that you can say. I mean, still, there's plenty to be said yeah. about vaccines. But like, all yes. of the stuff mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Yeah. And I think like episode four was about GMOs because because that was one of my pet peeves since I was an undergrad was just misinformation <laughs> about genetic engineering and just, you know, fear oh, of biotechnology, um, not just limited to food, but but really, you know, to everything which really hampers our ability to to innovate. That's so well said. And I'm really glad you mentioned GMO. And I think, Jess, you also mentioned uh, mentioned organics, I think, in what you were just talking about. And th those actually topics are kind of on our list as with some uh, <laughs> topics we know you've covered and you're coming. And I don't know, I see so much anti-GMO. As, as they laugh. Uh, so I know. much. Oh, <laughs> we're yeah. just, it's we're it's not funny. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's funny, not funny. Yeah. Exactly. Funny, not funny. 
yeah. frustrated funny or something. So we're I think we are definitely going to ask you about those, maybe for a little more, you know, in-depth um, comments on, on those topics. Sure. But maybe as far as, you know, kind of looking at the wellness industry today, we we're thinking maybe we st might start just like a little broader and then kind of get into some of these specific topics. So a first question, once again, just throwing out to whoever might want to answer this is, how would you define the wellness industry? What What is the wellness industry? Yeah. So, I mean, I, maybe I'll, I'll start and I'll let, let Jess chime in, but I think, you know, the wellness industry is really any sort of consumer company that is purported to assist with kind of overall health and well-being. And mm -hmm. at face value, that sounds really great. Um, the problem is, is that there is not a standardization of what that means. And so, the word wellness or the logic or the term wellness has really been co-opted by companies that are profiting off of selling consumer things that maybe don't really improve their health and well-being. Um, so things that you would see in the wellness space include obvious things like um, supplements, dietary supplements, which could include um, vitamins and minerals, but it can include pretty much any dietary supplement, protein supplements, you know, detox teas, what, you know, all of those things um, that are, that are non-medical interventions. Um, but it also includes things like beauty products and cosmetic products and a lot of these um, sort of uh, interventions purported to be related to improving longevity or hacking your health and and things mm -hmm. like that so it's a really broad catch-all and and ultimately makes a lot of money because um as as i'm sure we'll get into it's really there's really almost no regulation to what these companies can can say and can sell to people and Andrea just said it so beautifully. The, the only thing I, I'll say is I'll I'll define the wellness industry by telling you what what it isn't, which mm -hmm. is that it isn't about wellness. Um, it is absolutely nothing to do about wellness. It is not at all improving our wellness. It's about fear mongering and making people think that they need to be doing things, buying certain products. Um, this idea that we can biohack our health. Um, it focuses on all the wrong things. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's turned our society and our culture into one that is completely fearful um, and misguided and misinformed. Um, and really, the reality of what wellness actually is, is quite simply being mindful of the things that we're consuming without obsessing over them, moving our bodies, um, getting vaccines to prevent uh, <laughs> preventable illnesses, and, you know, getting outside, getting fresh air, and, and managing our, our mental and emotional health as, as best as possible. So that there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that contrast that you set up between like maybe these beliefs that the wellness industry wants to kind of coax us to believe about what we might need for, for what our wellness, you know, whatever that means. But then the way you just describe it, it really can just boil down to some maybe relatively kind of simple principles that don't need to be. Yeah. So really complicated. It's, it's a phenomenon called the risk perception gap, right? And and it's really exploited by these companies that really utilize quite a bit of predatory marketing where they get people yeah. um, anxious or fearful. We know um, evoking emotion is the most effective marketing tactic. So it's getting people scared about ingredients, a single ingredient or a single chemical yes. or a single, um, you know, uh, medication instead of of focusing on good habits and healthy patterns that actually um, are going to have a much bigger impact on your day-to-day -day life. You know, we see, we see misinformation about, you know, uh, preservatives that have very important uses in our food supply. And because certain people on social media can't pronounce a chemical name, you know, therefore it's, it, it's, it's automatically harmful. Um, I can pronounce them all just because you can't pronounce them doesn't mean that, that they're scary. Um, but again, it gets people fixated on this thing and then, and then fixated on the fact that they want to try and control that instead of focusing yes. on these very less sexy things like, 
good sleep hygiene, alleviating your stress, get preventative medicine, you know, um, a diverse diet without fixating on whether you had ice cream that day, you know, it, it, there's there's very few things in and of themselves that that a that a single exposure or enjoying something in moderation particularly with regard to foods are going to be you know automatically harmful and and killing you and causing cancer and being toxic and disrupting your endocrine function and whatever mm. any of the other claims that the wellness industry wants to make it's it's hard for the I mean, this is why our podcast exists, right? And and ours too. It's hard for the average person because those mm -hmm. companies are such good marketers, and they're they're doing that. What did you call it? Emotion based mm -hmm. marketing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like Fear based marketing. Absolutely. It's difficult for somebody who's not a scientist mm -hmm. to be able to spot that or mm -hmm. not to get caught up in that. If yeah. even, even I am a scientist and if it's not in my area, I like, I, I like to think I have a little bit better of a bullshit detector, but if it's not in my area, then maybe I can't tell fact from fiction. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's something that we talk about a lot, right? Like, you know, the, these um, logical fallacies, right? The appeal to a relevant authority where we have, um, I'll, you know, I'll use him as an example because we, we made a meme about him today, but you know, carnivore MD, he's all over social media, like pushing this, this carnivore diet. He's a psychiatrist. He knows oh nothing gosh. about right. biological medicine and certainly nothing about dietary nut nutrition science, but because he's got an MD, he's using that to appeal as an authority figure and convince people that not consuming fiber is somehow good for them, which it's demonstrably not. 100%. That's such a good example of like a psychiatrist having the MD after their name and then people just naturally just assuming that therefore they're an authority. I feel like I see that with other with other doctor uh, titles yes. as well, like doctor of naturopathy, doctor yes. of chiropractic, like you see yes. these like oh. titles and maybe they wear a white lab coat in a commercial or in an advertisement. Yes. And it's just so easy for people to be drawn in. Like I trust that person, they're, they're a doctor. Totally, this totally. Is, well, and, and then this other thing that we, we talk about a lot is um, confusing that, well, people thinking that medical doctors, that there's this hierarchy and that we as, you know, we have doctorates, but we're not medical doctors, that there's a hierarchy and that medical doctors are, are above us. That is not mm. accurate. These are clinicians who are yes. experts in clinical medicine, but actually my, my husband's an ER doc and he's the first one to raise his hand and say, I didn't have any formal training in biostatistics or research design and method. You know, what did he have? Like uh, an hour lecture on epidemiology and, you know, in one of his medical school classes. And unfortunately yes. a lot, you know, phys physicians are seen as the experts when really the, all, all, more often than not, they don't have that scientific research expertise. There, there's research that shows that they don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, apart from them, like objectively only getting one hour of biostats lecture or pain science, which is something that Jenny and I talk about, but then there's research on like, oh, how well do doctors in like from a statistical standpoint, incorporate new information? Um, very rarely. To, yeah. They're like, very or, generational ways. issues. Yeah. Right. Right. That especially older generations of, of docs when evidence-based medicine wasn't really a thing back when they were trained. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, we have lots to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about like MDs and, um, you know, the field of medicine versus like wellness. And while we're kind of establishing maybe some definitions, could you give us a, just like kind of a distinction between, just cause I do think some people might not quite understand what would, how would you define the difference between the wellness industry or say wellness practitioners versus conventional medicine? Yeah. Like, what's, I what's mean, so, there? so typically conventional medicine is using, um, science-based practices or evidence-based practices. There is a, there is a little bit of a difference between science-based and evidence-based practices. Um, but they're typically using things that have data to support their use in order to, um, treat patients or be involved in patient care. Um, and, and those, 
interventions, whether it is uh, treatment guidance or, or physical medications or medical devices, those are all developed by scientists. Um, and so, you know, all of those things typically have evidence to support them, but also regulatory oversight. So depending on what arm right. of medicine you're working in, um, any medications um, are approved by the Food and Drug Administration for both safety and efficacy. Um, and they typically are also monitored after approval for post-market surveillance um, and can be further regulated and even withdrawn if they are uh, deemed to be unsafe or deemed Deemed to be um, safe but ineffective, which is a little bit of a slower process, but we just saw, saw that with phenylephrine. Um, and, and so you have this regulatory oversight. And that's true whether you're talking about these medications, this could be over-the-counter medications or prescription, but it's also true of medical devices. So any sort of um, implants or transplants or things like that, those are also regulated. And the same would be true for um, biologic um, therapeutic. So we're seeing that in the cancer and the autoimmunity and the latent viral space right now with like CAR T and immunotherapies, where these are not drugs in the traditional sense, but they're cells that have been engineered to better target cancer, things like that. And those are also regulated by by the FDA. Um, so a lot of a lot of kind of medicine is is really things that fall into that bucket or things that are guided by by evidence. But I also think it's important to note that it's not black and white and it's not what exists today is what will ever exist because we we do always learn and we evolve and practice guidance changes with new science and so on and so forth. Um, and and before I hand it over to Jess, because I know she has something to say, we often hear the 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 phrase allopathic medicine. And this was mm -hmm. something that that term was actually coined by the creator of homeopathy, um, a German dude in the 1700s. And he created it to essentially create a dichotomy and insinuate that conventional medicine is somehow, you know an opposing force to homeopathy, whereas homeopathy is sugar pills um, and, and medicine is medicine. So, you know, eventually I want to actually tackle like, where did the word allopathic come from? But, but that's really where it came from. It was, it was a guy who was trying to kind of erode um, trust in, in evidence-based mm -hmm. practices. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So I, I, I'll just keep it brief because Andrea just said everything I wanted to say. Um, we share a brain at this point, but I would just also add that, you know, there's this this idea that, oh, you know, alternative medicine, it's only alternative because they don't have the money to do the studies. This is incorrect. This is a right. multi-billion dollar industry. There is certainly money to be to be doing these studies. And the difference between convention and, uh, conventional and alternative medicine, you know, Andrea just said, we acknowledge science is ever changing. You know, it's possible that we will get information that changes our understanding of these things. It's the authority with which these alternative practitioners and wellness industry people, they say with such confidence and authority, these things work when, first mm -hmm. of all, we don't have the data that, that we just don't have the data to show that. So they're making these claims that are not evidence based. And that's our big one of our biggest gripes with this industry. And, that's and, and I it, know I. Oh, sorry, Travis. I was just going to say that's what makes it so attractive. Like, oh, they're saying this so confidently. And those scientists they always disagree and they keep changing what they're the saying. Wishy-washy, yeah. right? Wishy-washy. Yeah. Flip-floppers, um, you know, and, and, and that's obviously another very clever marketing tactic, right? It's that appeal to emotion mm -hmm. um, and it and instills confidence and trust. Um, and, you know, I think we kind of alluded to it, but there's very little, you know, in some cases, no regulation over what is sold as a wellness product, um, even your your vitamins and minerals, which um, a lot of people, when we talk about supplements, they're like, well, what about vitamins and minerals? And like, yeah, those are dietary supplements. It doesn't matter whether it's called flat tummy tea or vitamin C, they're, they're all regulated under the same umbrella and they're not regulated as medications. They are essentially, um, you know, they fall under, um, you know, food, um, but not even as stringently as food. So they, they, they have very little 
um, pre-shelf monitoring. They don't have to demonstrate efficacy. Um, legally, they're not supposed to make any claims to treat illness or anything, but we know that that is not um, adhered to. And while FDA has authority to remove things that are misbranded in the supplement world, um, they're overstretched in dealing with you know, a lot of other things. And so a lot of those supplements kind of fly under the radar um, because they they kind of exploit the priorities of regulatory agencies. Um, and, and you can thank the lack of regulation to a, a pretty antiquated law that came out uh, several decades ago, um, basically to, to um, exclude dietary supplements from having to fall under the umbrella of the FDA. That is so helpful to have you explain because, yeah, that distinction between if um, if these supplements are considered dietary versus like um, something that people take for health issues or for um, as medicine, then they just don't, they're not as tightly regulated at all. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like uh, a lot of these kind of wellness supplements that you see, like I'll see a commercial for say some mushroom tea that's like meant to boost boost brain health or something. And then if you look in the little corner with white lettering on white background that you can hardly see, it says like these statements have, have not, not been, been evaluated. evaluated. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. By the FDA. So it's like that, like, as long as they say that little thing, then they can say whatever they want Correct. almost, right? 100%. Exactly. So that's the loophole. Um, and we know people are not reading the fine print on those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very often they're positioned next to legitimate medical interventions at the store. Um, nice. and, and, you know, a lot of them kind of, you know, exploit this, you know, I want, I want the answer. I want to feel better quickly. I want this magic pill. I, you know, and people are always kind of on this quest for more with less because, you know, I get it, right? It's it's um there's a lot of pressures in our society, particularly in the US, but but it's not limited to the US. And so um, you know, they'll make these outlandish claims and and also they're not legally required to disclose every single ingredient. And that's something that has potential real harms associated with it. Um, not not just you know, for the obvious, but because they, a lot of these things, herbs and, and whatnot can have legitimate medical interaction, interactions yes. with real medications and can mm -hmm. cause serious um, side effects. And even things that we know are good for you, like things that are essential micronutrients, like vitamin D and vitamin C and iron, there is such thing as too much of a good thing. You can experience toxicity with anything at a certain dose. And so there's often this logic where it's like, well, well, I need some of this for mm -hmm. optimal health. Therefore, I should just take more of it and that will be even better. And that's not the case either. That makes so much sense. And uh, in addition to, uh, to that being misleading and potentially leading people down um, the wrong path, uh, is it also the case that sometimes what the supplement says, uh, like what the bottle says is inside, if we're talking supplements, uh, when it's actually tested, like via oversight, it's the ingredients that it says are in there are not even in there because yes. there's like so little Correct. regulation. And also sometimes the ingredients they say are supposed to be in there, your immune, bo immune boosters and all that, they're not in there. And there are things that they don't say are in there that are in there. Um, and so, yeah, incredibly misleading, right. false advertising. And again, because there's very little regulatory oversight, um, you've got these labs, you know, and, and let's be real, like, right, there's this appeal to nature fallacy. I'm going to take these supplements because they're natural. These things that are in a pill are being made in a lab. Um, so they're not <laughs> natural. The lab is probably lower quality than a regulated lab that would be making medications, but it's still a lab yeah. and they're still being synthesized. They're not picking pills off a bush and putting them in a bottle. Um, yes. but, but again, there's very little quality control. There's very little regulatory mm -hmm. oversight. There's very little, um, you know, good laboratory practices. And these are all things that are really important um, to ensure that the things you're putting in your body are one safe and two, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that that's a major issue with with kind of the supplements on the whole. I always wondered, because there, there are athletes who 
you know, they take these supplements and then it, it turns out that there are banned substances and they didn't realize it. And like, is that ever really true? Or did they know that they were taking the banned substances? Oh my goodness. And- that is, that's a million dollar question. And I remember, I can't remember the runners. I mean, I, you know, I should remember her name cause I, I do run, but um, you know, the one who claimed that she got the testosterone um, agonist or the, um, um, analog from eating a pork burrito that had awful in I can't remember what her name is she had like a 10 year ban from track and field um someone knows who I'm someone listening knows exactly who I'm talking about but she claimed that she got it from eating you know uh inadvertently eating you know um uh bull test um not not bull test uh, pork testicles but but the level of this meat that she would have had to consume to get the levels in that drug test were you know she it would have been like five two kilogram burrito you know it was insane oh my Um, god so, so Travis, to answer your question, I don't know the answer to that, but my suspicion would be that if there were trace contaminants of a banned substance, um, they would have to be consuming a lot of that dietary supplement inadvertently. What's more likely the case is they probably know they're taking what they're taking and then they're trying to use it as an excuse once they get called out by WADA or something. Right. Yeah. For the athletes that I don't like, you know, I assume they're lying, but for the ones that I do, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. You want to believe them. Travis. Um, oh my goodness. I have a question about like the lack of regulation that it seems exists within the U.S. with regard to a lot of these supplements and the wellness industry in general. Do you know, and uh, I'm not sure like how much you've looked into this, but how does like this lack of regulation here in the U.S., which is where we're all based, how does it compare to other countries? Is it particularly bad here? Um, Or uh, do other countries seem to have similar issues? It's definitely a universal phenomenon. I would say the market is the biggest Mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, There are different regulations country by country with regard to we'll, we'll use supplements as part of kind of the wellness umbrella. But there's a lot of other things that fall under that bucket, like these at home fake diagnostic tests and ozone up your butt and all that. But but if we're talking about kind of supplements. There are certain countries that while they still don't have efficacy data, they may have some additional um, safety requirements. So you might Mm -hmm. find that supplements may vary country by country, Um, but it's but it's still very loose. And there's still a lot of these um, ineffective and potentially harmful things that um, that you can find available in in many countries in many Mm -hmm. european countries even and and asian countries you can actually um you know certain types of alternative um practices i don't want to call it alternative medicine because there's no evidence to support it but things like homeopathy um like like there's like the homeopathic pharmacy on the corner when i was in germany and and um you know you can actually some of those are even covered by insurance i think Countries are now kind of cracking down on that a little bit more. For example, I think France removed um, insurance payment for homeopathy. And I think UK is working on it, although King Charles is a big proponent of homeopathy because, you know, anecdotes. Um, but oh, no. but again, like I, there's different issues in different countries. And a lot of it is kind of how they assess risk and who their regulatory agencies are. Um but kind of the natural product world is is still this nebulous entity in many places. So I I mean I I'm not entirely sure how these other countries approach this. Um, but just mm-hmm. sort of what Andrea was just saying, I think it's important to note that our approach to assessing risk, and now I'm talking about things that we do regulate, um, is very different than the approaches taken by other countries like in Europe and UK, etc. So we take mm. a risk based approach and they take a hazard based approach. And this has led to a lot of confusion. And a lot of people will say, oh, look, American products are are not as good. They're not as safe because look, this is banned in this other country and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, half the time, they're not actually banned in other countries. It's just that they're labeled differently, which Andrea could talk about that. She's got a lot to say about that, but we could talk about that later. Um, But just, you know, in general, 
general, we, we take a different approach where the U.S. will, we take into account likelihood of exposure to things, whereas mm-hmm. other countries do not. So if there's even the potential for risk, that's called the hazard-based approach. This is what other countries take. Um, and there are pros and cons to different approaches. There are reasons um, why you may take one approach over another. It's not that one is superior to, to another, but I think that this mm-hmm. has led to a lot of this misconception that American products are less safe than in other countries. Right. Yeah, I certainly hear claims like that. Like, um, and, and I've seen you guys, I think you talked about this in a recent podcast episode of yours that I heard about. It was very yes. informed. Just to realize the standards may be different between countries. It's like maybe comparing apples to oranges when you're trying to make this claim that, well, in this country, this, this um, substance is banned or whatever. Right. Like, and yeah, and actually, more. in many instances, they're not actually banned. They just have a different regulatory agency. So the, they're named differently. But people, right. people sometimes right. struggle with fact checks. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a nice way of putting it. So another question that we wanted to ask you just kind of in relation to everything that we've been talking about is a topic I've seen you cover in some of your recent content, which is health coach. Uh, and like a wellness coach, I feel like those are kind of two different names for the same thing. But we, mm-hmm. at least in the yoga world, I find that that that's very common. Like a lot of people see health coaches or they offer their health coaching services. Could you just tell us a bit like what is a health coach? How is that different from a doctor, a, a medical yes. doctor? Yes. Yes. So health coaches and wellness coaches, um, they typically, I'll, I'll kind of start with, you know, what they, what they advertise to be, but they typically are offering services to help with health concerns or health problems, or, um, you know, often they'll, they'll, um, offer support for chronic conditions. Um, you know, some of them advertise nutritional support or stress, you know, or, or they're going to give you accountability and, and have you stick to an exercise regimen. Um, I think it's really important for everyone to know that there is no standardization, no credentialization, no qualifications required to call yourself a health coach or a wellness coach. Um, and, And if they're making those claims that they can do those things, it is possibly um, very likely that they have no expertise and should not be offering those services. And a lot of people will just Mm -hmm. pay to play. They'll buy a certificate from some online, I don't know, company that sells certificates. um, And it means nothing. And this is very common for like running coaches too. It's like people who just ran their first 5k are now all of a sudden a running coach. And I'm like, (laughs) okay. Um, you know, so, so there, again, there's no standardization, there's no credentialization. So there could be a very qualified person who calls himself a health coach. And there could be someone mm-hmm. who has absolutely no grounds to be speaking on anything they're talking about calling themselves a health coach. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, really um, a slippery slope. And it's very distinct from, anyone that has credentials or, or scientific practice degree. And that would include like registered dietitians. Um, and I think that that, that kind of realm is also important because then you have the nutritionists where nutritionist is a term that has no meaning either. Um, whereas registered dietitian is a credentialed clinical practice degree. Thank you for outlining that distinction because I certainly see, yes, definitely a lot of like nutrition services offered within what I see in, in the yoga world. And, yeah. um, but yeah. that that's actually distinct from, yes, actually licensed dietitian. And yes. Yeah. That's again, uh, very hard for the, the person mm-hmm. out there seeking services yeah. to differentiate. I, like, I don't know a nutritionist from a dietitian, right? Right. Um, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully you can look at their credentials on their website and find out, but the better the marketer, the more, you know, confusing and, and seemingly qualified they're going to make themselves look. And and we always say, you know, it's really unfortunate that, you know, there are some very real issues with our healthcare system. Like, you know, I, I was just trying to make an appointment with, with a doctor and they were like, oh yeah, no problem. We can get you in in 68 months. You know, no, I have an issue. (laughs) 
appointment. Sorry. Right <laughs> now. So what is it? What is an appointment in six to eight months going to do? Right. And then you're talking, you know, when you think about people who are dealing with chronic health issues or chronic pain, they are desperate for, ha- for help, you know, and th- again, there are some very real issues that drive people to these alternatives and make them especially susceptible to these predatory marketing tech, you know, marketing tactics. Like they just, they're looking for help and they don't know how to discern who's real, what's real, what's not. And it's just the whole thing is really um, unfortunate. And and that's yeah. obviously what we, we try to combat with a lot of our information. Yeah, I think you do a really good job offering these like concrete tips to help people discern. And yeah, that's like a big part of why we wanted to talk about all of this today, just to help people, you know, spot the BS when they see it out there. And kind of along the lines of nutrition and some of the things we've been talking about, we've mentioned several times um, supplements to up to this point, supplements and vitamins, but Mm -hmm. we did kind of want to concretely ask you, because I I do think there may be some misconceptions around this in the yoga world, but for example, you go to the store and you buy your off-the-shelf multivitamin pill or a powder that maybe you put in water and then drink. Uh, What... What does the evidence suggest about how um, effective that is as far as you supporting one's health? Does it actually um, more often the case just result in like expensive pee, which is definitely something that I've heard before. What's your, what's your informed opinion about that? Multivitamins. Yeah. So, so yes, it's mostly expensive urine. Um, There's been, I mean, there are decades of, of studies, um, particularly looking at some of these multivitamins that are essential micronutrients, you know, zinc and vitamin C, vitamin D, iron, et cetera. Um, We know broadly that a lot of people are not eating a diverse diet, but in reality, these things are best absorbed um, at the levels you would need. You don't need a lot of it. You need a tiny little bit of it. Um, But they're best absorbed or best obtained through food because of the way that the chemical structure and the what we call bioavailability is. Um, And the bioavailability is a fancy term for, you know, actually being able to be used by by your body, by the cells that that need those micronutrients. Um, Again, because there's very little regulatory oversight in formulation and compounding and things like that with supplements, you know, you could could buy an iron supplement and it could be, you know, ferric sulfide in one and ferrous sulfate in another. And they're all kind of slightly different formulations of iron. Um, or you could buy two that you think are, you know, both ferrous sulfate, but, you know, one is compounded in a way that it's more bioavailable than the other. And so you could think that you're buying equivalent things and taking equivalent doses, but in reality, you're not actually using any of it. It's all just going through your GI tract. So even with substances that we know we need, um, there's not a lot of data to support that taking them in like a multivitamin form is really helpful. Um, and, and, and U.S. Preventative Task Force actually came out with a, with a big um, report earlier this year that also stated that um, taking these sorts of vitamins, um, you know, multivitamins and so on, um, don't offer any sort of preventive health benefits for things like cardiovascular disease and similar. Um, and so in reality, if you're you're a healthy individual, um, again, it's expensive urine, you don't need it. It's best to get them from your, your diet. Um, there are, of course, ex- exceptions. For example, during pregnancy, there are certain things that are mm-hmm. absolutely recommended. Those should be overseen by a physician, a medical provider, um, a, a true medical provider, not a naturopath or a chiropractor. Um, and, and if you have very specific medical conditions, there are certain medical conditions where you're unable to metabolize things properly, you might need supplementation. But those would be very specific examples. Um, or if you had specific deficiencies, again, those should be all overseen by a trained clinician. I'm going to let Jess One. jump in because I know she has something to say. No, I was literally the 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 last thing that you just said is that really unless you are, you know, trying to get pregnant or are pregnant or you have a diagnosed deficiency, more often than not these things are unnecessary. Um and then I, I I'm sorry, Andrew, my, my kids came in, so I don't know if you if we were talking about it, but this idea of in addition to supplements, but then the IV um oh, yeah, vitamin yeah. therapy oh, yes. that people are doing, someone just died. Yeah. 
a, a woman just died. I forget exactly. I'm not sure if it was because uh, it was Beth. um it was contaminated with a solvent, right? Okay, yeah. is that what I it think was? So yeah, yeah. It's so crazy uh, that uh, unregulated. Yeah, yeah. Getting well, an IV, you know, like yeah. And the other thing is, is, is typically these vitamins, especially like name brands and things like that, they're, they're kind of expensive, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, instead of spending your money, which is really wasting your money on those, you know, buy some produce and Mm -hmm. eat that because those are chock full of those micronutrients and they're going to be absorbed by your body, um, you know, in a more effective manner and they taste way better. Instead of take a pill. You can just like walk around with your bunch of kale chomping on it, drizzle some olive oil on it while you're walking around. Oh, I guess oils are, no, well, olive oil is not a seed oil, but um, oh, right. so that one's, that one's okay. Are. That one's okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, um, I have, I've heard some people will say, uh, you know, I do know that it's um, suggested that a multivitamin pill will just give me expensive urine, but I still take it anyway, just, um, just in case. Yeah, like, so I right. don't feel like I have to eat all the veggies or what, you know, to um, compliment. But I, um, I wonder what do you what you think about that? Take yeah, it I mean, there's in case, like, there's, again, if you, there are a lot of acute toxicity um, reactions, uh, acute liver poisoning, and so on due to overuse of supplements. And, and those can be even what you perceive as benign, even these multivitamins and things like that, there are some very unpleasant side effects from overdosing on things like vitamin C and iron and, you know, beyond just, yeah, beyond just like GI symptoms. Mm -hmm. Like, again, you only need teeny tiny amounts of it. Um, There's, there's no robust evidence to say like a taking it just in case is, is beneficial. Um, And I, and I know it's really confusing because there are a lot of physicians who still recommend it to your patients. Oh, just take a multivitamin. It's all good, right. you know? And this is kind of this um, this relic of, you know, conflation of clinical provider with scientists and also especially those that have kind of not stayed up to date on new data um, where, you know, every day there there is more and more evidence to suggest that it's really not beneficial and in many instances can be harmful. And it also is quite privileged, you know, to to be able to say, oh, l- let me just in case like pay $50 for this multivitamin pill when there are people who clearly, you know, yeah. won't have access to that or means to afford things like that. And this has very real implications. It leads to a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. Switching yes. gears, something that I know we're, we're going to talk about, but the the myths and misconceptions surrounding organic versus conventional. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just ask you about using that. this example, how we know organic costs a lot more, and no, it's not superior nutritionally. No, it's not better for the environment or any of these things. And we could dig into all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we there was a survey done among uh, registered dietitians, and like I think. It was something like 94% said that they saw that um, people lower socio people of lower uh, socioeconomic status were actually avoiding eating fruits and vegetables because they couldn't afford organics and they were scared of the conventional alternatives. And that is horrific. Obviously, I don't need to tell anyone who's who's here right now, you know, for a variety of reasons, people are not getting access to fruits and vegetables and fiber and all the things that we need. So it's a it's a really big problem. That is absolutely a problem and definitely plays into, um, yeah, socioeconomic status and class and um, just making people worry and stress about things that actually could be completely counterproductive in the way that you're describing. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad you brought up organic. I know you um, have put out a good amount of content on both this and GMOs, which was another question that we wanted to ask you about, but we just know how widespread uh, organic, uh, the the, you know, just that- The marketing term, it's on like every other uh, product at the grocery store always costs more like you explained, Um, but it sounds like you're suggesting organic is not necessarily healthier or better for the environment. Yeah, that's 100% true. And, and, um, Jess, I actually pulled up the data. So, so there's two different, two different kind of data sets. One was a survey 
from registered dietitians and it was basically um, messaging about organic led to excessive concern about the safety of conventional produce. Mm -hmm. But there was a, a, a quantitative um, study that actually demonstrated that that this led to reduced fruit and vegetable consumption particularly wow. for lower lower income individuals. And of course, we know not eating enough fiber, Americans are not doing that to begin with. And there's a lot yes. of health issues associated with that, not just gastrointestinal, but cardiovascular issues, cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, and so on. Um, but yeah, so the big TLDR is that <laughs> they are functionally equivalent in nutrition and healthfulness and... Um, Organic produce costs, uh, what is it? The average is about 15% more to grow, but on average costs at least 50% more to the consumer. And a lot of that is through clep because of clever marketing and branding. Um, and, and again, we're talking about U.S. Um, organic agriculture regulation. So this is USDA because we always get the, well, I buy from the farmer's market and it's my little backyard garden and we don't use any pesticides. That's not what organic means at the grocery store. Organic agriculture is large-scale agriculture using USDA organic regulations, and that includes pesticides. So organic produce still uses pesticides. They just use those that are certified to be inclusive of organic, meaning they're, they're naturally derived from chemicals that things in nature are producing to ward off pests. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are quite noxious and can be higher in toxicity at lower doses, Many of those organic pesticides are worse for the environment or for the ecology because since they're produced by plants to deter things from eating them, they can impact all sorts of insects, including non-target species. Like if you wanted to kill aphids, some organic pesticides also kill ladybird beetles, which would naturally eat aphids. So now you're killing aphids, but also their natural predator, um, many of them bioaccumulate. And again, we hear a lot, well, it already is in nature, so it's fine. Well, just because something is in one level in nature doesn't mean you quadruple that level and it's still okay. You're adding more. The mm -hmm. dose makes the poison with everything. So things like copper sulfate bioaccumulate, and they actually have very far reaching effects, including on fish um, and waterways. And that's a very commonly used um, an, uh, organic pesticide. So one of the advantages for conventional pesticides is a lot of them are kind of derived from natural pesticides, organic pesticides, but they're tweaked in the lab chemically so that they're more specific. They only target particular pest, um, you know, particular plant pests or insect pests. Um, they can be used at lower dosages or they biodegrade more quickly. So it's basically about altering some of those chemical structures to reduce some of those ecological impacts. Um, and then more broadly, when you look at yield of organic farming versus conventional farming, because organic farming prohibits the use of genetic engineered crops, you often have lower yields per hectare of land or, or similar compared to a conventional product of the same plant variety, where they might be able to use a genetically engineered variant that maybe has increased yield, produces larger fruits. Um, and so as the population of the world grows and we have less arable land, um, you're producing less yield per area, which means you need more area, which means you're um, deforesting more land, potentially, you're having more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, it, it's very multifactorial. But yeah, there's no right. concrete evidence that organic is superior in, in those regards. And, and I don't know if you mentioned, you probably did, that was like a, the most beautiful thesis I've perfect. ever heard in my life, but, yes. um, but it was like, uh, oh, but or, uh, organic pesticides are less effective, right? So you typically they have are. to use more, more of them. them. Yes. And I, I don't know, there's this idea that like pesticide, bad, like there's a reason yes. we use pesticides. If we didn't use pesticides, we wouldn't have the crop yield that we have, right? And we'd have right. fewer fruits and vegetables and less produce and all the things. So people, need to be mindful of that. So just well, to want to, yep. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I just want to repeat for the hundredth time, because I don't think that this is something that whenever we say it, people are shocked. Organic produce still uses pesticides, right? And that's right. Not bad. Like we'll say 
it's not necessarily, a, it's not a bad thing, right? We, we use pesticides for a reason. Buy what you want to buy. If, if mm-hmm. it makes you feel better to buy organic or if you go to the store and it looks better, go ahead and buy organic. But if you can't afford organic or you don't want to buy, like there, there shouldn't be guilt. Andrea and I, mm-hmm. we never buy organic unless we get to the store and things, the, the produce just looks better than the conventional alternatives. Like, yeah. Why would I want to pay more money for something that's not better? Um, and the other thing in this context, and Andrea, sorry if you mentioned it and I just didn't hear it, but the EWG is something that we have to talk about in this context. The Environmental yeah. Working Group, they put out the Dirty Dozen list. Yes. Um, and it is that the amount of people, especially, I see this every time I log into any mom group, all parent group, whatever it is, all the time. Don't feed your children anything on the Dirty Dozen list or only buy, you know, organic, whatever. I think strawberries, I forget what's at the top of the list. Yeah. It has led to so much fear, unnecessary yes. fear, overspending, and this obsession that is is just like, it's, it's like a slippery slope. And then it leads to all, oh, well, then I can only buy clean beauty and non-toxic yes. and chemical free, which by the way means nothing. And they yeah. also, I mean, they also make lists for like the sunscreens that are toxic and the cooking implements that are, I mean, it's the, the environmental working group, they use the word environment in their name and they create this, this health halo that they're all ecologically concerned and they're an activist group that is funded predominantly by large organic farms um like stony brook and is it stony brook stony valley i don't know what it's called you know the one with the oh, yeah. yeah stony stony field. stony field yes um though those types of organizations um they they're not evidence-based they exaggerate toxicological li- um risks of conventional produce and scare people from eating produce um and They don't include organic pesticides when they review what's dirty. They only include synthetic pesticides. And the reason for that is because conventional pesticides are regulated for safety and residue levels when organic pesticides don't have the same amount of stringent regulation. So farmers that are using organic pesticides can apply them more liberally and there's much less oversight over what's safe to use. They don't have the same toxicological um, evaluations that conventional pesticides do. So. Huge realizations. Yeah, mic drop. Mic drop from the two of you. I mean, the other Thanks. thing is, is like, we just have to get away from like this, this fear of chemicals, right? As just said, like, yes. there's nothing inherently wrong with pesticides. Pesticides yes. target specific species. They don't target humans, right? They're targeting weeds or they're targeting insects or they're targeting a fungus. We are not weeds. We're not plant cells. We're not fungal cells. We're not arthropods, right? So, wow. you know, and then when, by the time the food gets to us, whether it's conventionally grown or organically grown, they're processed, right? Produce is processed. You know, everything is processed that we eat and there's nothing inherently wrong with processing. But part of that processing means washing those things because beyond just pesticides, things that grow in the ground are grown with poop and poop has bacteria in it and viruses and fungus. And we have to make sure that we're not eating poop when we eat. I I wanted to use a different expletive, but I, I wanted to keep it clean. <laughs> but my point is, is that you're not, you're not pulling the potato out of the ground and chomping on it. First, it's being washed and sanitized. So it's not covered in feces. And also you're <laughs> not eating a potato raw. Cause that would give you major GI upset. But, but again, like these pesticides, it's not, first of all, you're not dousing things in them. They're, you're applying them right. in, in pretty right. small, small quantities to begin with. And by the time it gets to you, there's trace levels of it, if any. And we need to, again, this risk perception gap, we need to just eat produce. I don't even, mm-hmm. I shouldn't say this, but I rarely wash my produce if it's like fresh berries because I'm usually too impatient. And I'm eating them in the car on the way home from the store, like just got my blueberry tin in my lap and I'm just eating my blueberries. Um, and, and again, I am not concerned with the very, very tiny, minute trace potential residues of pesticides, which 
um, especially the conventional ones, are are demonstrably safe at the levels we would be exposed to. Right. They're present. The residue, it's like the most minute concentration of pesticides are if they're present on our produce. And then simply washing with under uh, running cold water, um, I think it removes, it's like a ni- over 90% of, or even higher. I forget what the actual percentage is, Andrew. I know we did a post on this and I can't remember, um, of pesticide residue mm-hmm. or any of the other stuff that Andrea is mentioning. So. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Such great points. Like, like, what does it come down to? The dosage, right? Like it's, yes. um, and, and with like that makes list the of poison. the, right. So at like the tiny, tiny levels, we're exposed to some of these things. It's been well established and, and tested that it's safe and it's fine. And we don't need to right. worry about these things. Right. And, and, you know, rel- related to the dirty dozen, they're, mm-hmm. they're basically trying to push people to buy organic versions of those, those 12 produce items right. on their list. They don't mention the levels of organic pesticides on the organic options of those, but the way that they rank them is it doesn't matter what the actual level of a pesticide was. If it's detected, whether it's 10,000 fold level lower than the threshold, they're going to say it's dirty because they found three of them on there. Even if you would have to eat, I don't know, a ton of strawberries to even hit the, the threshold for safety. Um, and so it's completely taken out of context and it's, and it's used to create fear and the end result. And this is why we get so heated about it. The end result is it's causing harm to people, particularly those of lower income who, who already have higher risks of poor health outcomes. And now they're simply just not eating produce because they've been scared by this which is so disappointing and counterproductive and bad for their health. It's like the opposite yes, outcome. It's the anti-wellness. The anti-wellness. Yes. Oh, the ironies, right? The ironies. I know. Well, thank you so much for speaking so eloquently to that. Uh, you did such a great job uh, really kind of laying that out. And I know you also have put out other content. So if, if listeners are, you know, want more information, uh, I would definitely recommend you, uh, send you to Justin Andrea's podcast and, some of their other content about this to dive dive further. But yeah, yes. the organic, we, yeah. we have a lot. We have several hours on organic and dozens of posts on that topic. Yeah. And for me, like when I first learned about that, that organic wasn't actually something I needed to worry about and spend extra money on, I found it actually like liberating. Like I can actually free myself from like putting this pressure on myself and and also yes. just overlooking the class implications and just the much bigger picture that you've spoken to here that I think it's really important for listeners to put in perspective. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. I mean, I I generally, I don't even go to the organic section at the grocery store unless like they're out of, you know, whatever carrots on any given day. And then I have, you know, if I, if I, if I need you them, I'll to. go over there begrudgingly, but then I kind of cry because I know I'm spending more for the same thing. Totally. Yeah. Same here. Uh, can we shift gears just a bit? Um, since you know, this is the yoga meets movement science podcast. And so, and I had like a question that we wanted to put to you. That's a little more specifically yoga. This is all like within the yoga world. Like this is all like yoga culture. I would say in the West, we see so many of these tendencies we've gone over today, but one kind of more specific, actually yoga movement based question I have for you. And I'd say this is really, really to both of you, but in my mind, I'm kind of thinking Andrea because of your specific background, but it's just a a claim that we tend to see a lot in the yoga world. A health claim is that, is that yoga as a practice. And again, we're talking asana, like modern postural yoga, that it Mm -hmm. boosts, boosts the immune system, that yoga boosts the immune system. And I wonder if you could give your, give your thoughts on a, on a claim like that. Yeah, sure. So there's this trend just in wellness and and even on some academic, you know, sites where they use the phrase boost your immune system. I think it's really important to kind of set the stage where you can't boost your immune system, right? It's not a muscle. You're not flexing it. You can't amplify it. It's It's this very complex network of organs and cell types and chemicals that the cells produce and different cell types in different proportions. And they're all communicating and moving around your body and doing all sorts of jobs at the same time. So, you know, when you hear these claims about boosting the immune system, it's like, well, 
what part of the immune system, what cell types, what chemicals, right. what are they doing? So, you know, mm -hmm. I like to reframe it as you want your immune system to be functioning, right? You want it to be optimal. You don't want it to be suppressed and you don't want it to be boosted because if you really could boost your immune system, that wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. And that is what we kind of see in a colloquial way in, in things like allergies and autoimmune disorders where your immune system is responding to things that it shouldn't be responding to. So you want it to be balanced. You want it to be functioning. So when we talk about kind of the things that ensure that your immune system is functioning, it's all about giving your body the tools that it needs to regulate itself because your body's pretty good at doing that. Um, yes, there are medical conditions where it's not, but broadly speaking, I think people, especially in wellness, don't give our body and our tight regulated homeostatic mechanisms right. enough credit. Um, but these are things that could loosely be affiliated with yoga. So things like movement, right? Exercise, daily exercise, right. Mild to moderate exercise is very beneficial for us, right? And if yoga is the way that you're going to exercise, great. That's fantastic. You know, I I go to yoga, right? I, I prefer a hot yoga class, not because I think that I'm sweating out my toxins, but because I have notoriously bad hamstrings and the heat allows me to uh, move them in ways that they wouldn't at room temperature. Um, so movement, exercise, great. That's good for immune system function. The next thing would be oftentimes you're doing a breath practice at the end, maybe a little few minutes of meditation. You're maybe in a dark room. Maybe your yoga teacher comes and massages your temple or puts a cold cloth over your head. And maybe it's got some, some uh, eucalyptus something and it's very relaxing, right? It's quiet. You're in a dark room. You're just chilling. You're just breathing. So mental health, you know, mental quiet, reducing stress levels also good for your immune system function, right? Um, we know that if you do those sorts of things, you might have better sleep quality too. And sleep is super important for your immune system as well. Um, that's actually where your immune system does most of its wound healing practice uh, or process is when you're sleeping. So if you have good quality sleep, because maybe you exercise and you're a little bit more relaxed and you disconnected from your devices for an hour because you were in a room where devices were not permitted, those are all things that can help your immune system function. Um, is it going to replace preventive health care and vaccines and, and, and a diverse diet? No. But if yoga is your conduit for doing some sort of things that we know are also good for your health, then, yes. then, then do that. Yeah. But, but again, I think we just want to reframe it that we're not, you know, flexing the immune system. These are just things that are good for our overall health. Absolutely. Thank you for putting that so eloquently. It it sounds to me like what you're suggesting is, yeah, it's not necessarily like this specific thing we're doing, like we're pushing this button when we do yoga. Right. Correct. But it's more about a bigger picture. And yeah, yeah. Would you would you say that maybe say maybe saying something like um, a yoga practice helps su support the immune system? Support absolutely. Be... Support support your immune health. Something like that. Support your immune system. And and the same could be said for going out for a walk or getting some fresh air or, you know, any, whatever kind of, you know, your outlet is for de-stressing, getting some exercise, you know, we know being fixated on the doom scrolling, especially in this era is not great. So, you know, even just getting away from your digital devices for a little bit, that's all beneficial, um, you know, and that should be coupled with the other things that support your immune system, like, your vaccines and good hygiene, right? Hand hygiene and food hygiene and all those sorts of things that are all really important too. Absolutely. So it could easily have just be said like washing your hands regularly supports your immune system. Like in, to, to a, in a similar yes. like kind of big Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Making that. sure your chicken is cooked thoroughly supports yeah. your immune system. 100%. <laughs> all of so those things. things. And yeah, again, you know, it's not sexy, right? It's not buzzworthy. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's not these outlandish claims that the mushroom coffee people are making or the, um, what's the, the coffee enema. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff, right? But it's, so but it's just these like fundamental habits that just improve. I mean, that's what wellness should be, right? Not the hacking yes. and the, you know, just, just having good patterns in your life.
Mm-hmm. So well said. Like it comes that. down. Yeah. It's yes. I we actually it. had. I know. I love it. You solved it. That was one of our questions for you. Is just yeah. Like um, you know, in contrast to all these claims about all these hyper specific things we need to be doing, like what would be some of your suggestions? And you actually just answered the question I didn't even ask. It's like perfect. <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's, it's not well, glamorous, right? Yeah. And 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 that's Support why it's not as, as yeah. Boost. Right. It's right. not, it's not as, it's not as sensational. It's not yes. scaring people and, and it's hard, right? Because it's this, it's this cumulative effect, right? You kind of have to like do these things regularly, right? You can't just take right. a pill and fix it quickly. You, you, you have to, and it's hard in our culture, right? Where we don't have a lot of free time and there's a lot of pressure and we live in a capitalist society and, you know, there's a lot of things um, that are kind of bombarding us all the time. But, but um, yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah. I was just going to say, Travis, you said it beautifully before and it's so true. Like what, what we're saying right now, it's not as sexy as the very definitive black and white statements. Like yes. this will save you. This will kill you. Like there's a big psychological component to all of this messaging and people take comfort in the very, you know, all or none black and white type mm-hmm. statements. Um, Cause again, they're said with such authority and confidence. And what we're saying, it's like, everything is like nuanced and it's like, well, this, this might reduce your risk if, you know, done with these other things and relative to someone's, you know, like it's, it's just, that's not sexy. I mean, that's the truth though. Um, And I think a lot of it also has to do with this desire where we're, I think so many of us feel out of control in our lives. I mean, you sprinkle a pandemic on that, right. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're all looking for ways to improve the quality and quantity of our lives. And that's, understandable, but these things are not the answer, you know? Right. And, and, and I think, I mean, this is sort of depressing to say, but like we have less control over that, you know, mm-hmm. over the, over those things. I mean, of course there are certain things we can engage in and avoid that are going to impact our health. But this idea that if we do this, our risk is going to be cut like that. That's not how, how it works. Right? right. That's just not how health risk works in reality. Um, so you do what you can, when you can, you can't guilt yourself. If like Andrea said, you know, after this, like I'm probably going to eat an Uncrustable, which is a peanut butter and jelly with white bread sandwich. Like, cause that's convenient. That's, that's what delicious. I have right now. Yes. And then, you know what, tomorrow night I'll have like, or last night I had a delicious salad. Like it, it's about, it's about balance and it's about, you can't obsess and you can't guilt yourself. And what we do, like Andrea, I think you said this before, there are very few things that if we engage in them every once in a blue moon, that they're going to have a profound positive or negative impact on our health, right? It, it's all about the patterns. Yep. Yep. Yes. Establishing like healthy habits and like yes. these picture like less sexy ways, like yes. Travis said, it just seems, yeah, it's just, that's harder to sell. That's not as marketable. It's not so as much harder to sell. Yeah. <laughs> but it's and more- there isn't, yeah. there isn't a single company that can go sell that to you and make billions of dollars. So <laughs> So that's right. the the challenge of being evidence based in in a world where that kind of marketing is so much more seductive, right? So yeah. like having a podcast where you talk about science, it's like nobody wants to listen to a science podcast, right? Yeah. Uh, well, and the nobody, thing is, is nobody the, wants that... to listen to. You. Oh, this might, this may or may not do this. <laughs> here's the nuance. Here's the here's yes. the you know, here's the pros, cons, or the, the four. But we need more evidence. data. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they're like, oh, those, those evidence-based folks, they never know the answer. Right. Wishy-washy. I was called wishy-washy kind of, yeah. Yes. So I'm like, your content has gotten so wishy-washy. But I actually took that as a really big compliment because that's- Yeah. Where does a badge more... of honor? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I- I personally feel like you two have answered really like all of these big questions that we wanted to ask you. You've done a fantastic job of it too. Uh, Travis, was there any other like final question that you maybe wanted to throw out or do you think we kind of covered what we were uh, hoping to? I, today? I would be interested in hearing Jess and Andrea's perspective on like how to determine especially on social media, like who's a reliable and credible source um, 
and just how to buy science. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. There are two good podcasts that you can listen to. You can listen oh, of to this course. one. Yes. You can listen to unbiased science podcast. And that is oh, it. Oh my that's goodness. It. That's, that's it. it. That's I mean, it. You're done. But, but, fine. That makes it that, easy. Actually, that that's but, perfect. People, there you go. Okay. Not, cut it. Cut it. People. We're done. No. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think the fact that we exist, obviously, we do see a real gap, right? Like, you know, people yes. don't know where to turn. And yes. so that's that's a tricky thing to answer. I guess we we have talked about certain red flags. Again, if you if someone mm-hmm. is making these again, all or none statements, if especially if but for only fifty nine ninety nine, you can, you know, cut your risk yeah. of cancer. You know, if, if you feel like they're selling you something, if they're stepping out of their lane of expertise. So I think we were talking about mm-hmm. this at the beginning of the episode. First of all, if they don't have scientific medical credentials and they're talking about scientific medical things, I mean, that's a big red flag. But also mm-hmm. if they're going outside their lane. I'm not an immunologist. You'll never hear me talking about T cells and memory and this and that, you know, all the things that Andrea could just, you know, spout off easily because that's not my area of expertise. And so we see, you know, there's a popular economist who steps out of her lane and is talking about, um, you know, COVID and, and, oh, you don't need to get vaccines. Pardon? Like what? What are, first of all, that's not accurate. He's had a very... (laughs) Prominent Ivy League institution, also. Right, right. Um, oh give it a little breadcrumbs. Follow the breadcrumbs. Yeah. Um, but yeah. anyway, so it's there. Really, is no easy answer, and it, and I think like many of us are trying to really um, come together. I think that's why these types of um, partnerships mm-hmm. and crossovers are super important because we are reaching different audiences. Um, but I think we're all still figuring it out. Just sort of if it feels like like you know like something does it doesn't pass the sniff test it probably is not legit well and i i think i think <laughs> um a couple of other kind of obvious things would be if you have an immediate emotional reaction to something that is often a clue that it is either false or mischaracterized and so there's this, you know you kind of want to take a quick pause um because these types of pseudoscience and fear-based marketing, they're either trying to evoke fear or anxiety about something. Um, So if you have a very like strong reaction to something, like take a breath, think, does this make sense to me? Does this, is this logical? Um, You know, look for confirmatory, you know, source, um, ideally a credible one. Um, You always want to look for, um, you know, aside from kind of that uh, emotional evocation, where's the information coming from? Is this, um, you know, second party, third party, um, fourth party information? So if it's coming from a news outlet, um, you know, that's at a minimum second, second party. But where are they getting their information from and who are they using as a source? Um, you know, and it can be hard again to tell who's a credible source if they have an MD after their name. Um, but again, you want to look for, you know, do they have any relevant expertise? Um, other things are you typically want to make sure that there's some sort of reference, right? If they're not citing their sources yes. or having receipts, um, you know, we go and see, you know, Food Babe and Flave City running through grocery stores screaming and they have no receipts, but for some reason, they're the ones that are being believed. Um, and then the other thing would be, um, you know, if they're if they're using an anecdote or a singular study to support something mm-hmm. and they're ignoring kind of all the other studies that say the exact opposite. Right. Um, or, you Scientific know, or, consensus. That's, yeah. so, sorry, to, Andrea, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's a big thing. I mean, and I think a lot of times these people are lauded as like, oh, whistleblowers, and they're just being suppressed by big pharma or the yeah. FDA. N- FDA, you know, no, that that's that's really. I mean, first of all, that's such a total conspiracy theory. Like, we where are our checks? Like, Andrea and I are still waiting for our checks, um, you know. And so, th- yeah, there's that. And then also, you know, I know it's tough, especially if you don't have a background in in science, to like pull up a study and know whether or not it's credible. But if they're citing one study with a sample size of 10, and let's say that only included like mice, you know, or, or whatever, like these, these are just some, some like low hanging fruit, red flags that, that should, you know, trigger your spidey sense. (laughs) Those are very helpful and very concrete tips. Thank you so much for, yeah, 
come in. That's yeah. that's um, just way to like empower an audience, you know, like yeah. really helping but all of us kind of hone. And, and, you know, I mean, Travis, you're absolutely right. Like, especially like the more insidious stuff, it's really hard, right? You sometimes really got to dig in. I mean, even with like the red dye number three, like every news outlet's like, oh, it's banned in Europe. And it's, it's not, it just uses a different name. But if you didn't know that, you know, European regulations of food dyes have a different nomenclature, you have no way of knowing that, right? Unless you're in the field. Um, and so it can be very convincing. And then, of course, it's evoking emotion. I mean, you've got multiple layers. And a lot of times um, the pseudosarn starts with like a nugget of reality or they use a yeah. scientific jargon. Um, like mm -hmm. inflammation is now the diagnosis of the day. Oh, yeah. Everything's inflammation. Um, yeah. And and microbiome. Yeah. I mean, those <laughs> have those have real meanings, but they're co-opted yeah. and, and exploited and, and exaggerated. And, um, but it gives it this air of legitimacy because it's using a science word, right? It's very hard. So misleading. So easy to be led astray, yeah. which is why we're super lucky to have resources like what you put out and super just like solid evidence-based, credible scientific information. And, Yes, uh, that's it's great to have resources like that. So people, like you said from the start, use listen to the Unbiased Science podcast. Like tune into resources where people are really trying to, you know, bring together this information and present it in in uh, understandable terms, but that are actually evidence based to help. Um, so you two, we are going to put links to all of your offerings in the show notes for this episode, uh, for this episode. We're so excited. If, you know, some people in our audience have not heard of you, we're very excited to introduce you to them. Uh, but would you like, where would you say one or two just easy spots if someone right now wanted to go follow your work? Where, where should they go? Yeah. So Instagram. All yeah. <laughs> all of our social handles are at unbiased SciPod on all platforms. And our website is unbiased .com, And we have searchable databases and all of our past posts and podcasts are there too. That makes it such a great resource. So people, they're not, so they don't have to dive in and, and dig down from the top, but they can actually look for certain topics. And you then would find think what that you... they would use it. <laughs> Instead, you get a lot You're of DMs working. and emails. I'm like, oh, we God. literally did this. Use our database. Use our database. Yes. Use our database. Like, literally, put in any word ever, and if there's anything remotely tangentially related to that word, it will appear, and all that's the awesome. sources will appear. I love that. Well, that's a good message to put out there too. Yeah, like troll through a little. Like, go out of your way to Please find the and then... database. You're yes, the database yes. before sending them a DM. Yeah. <laughs> Well, exactly. thank you both for having us. This was really yes. a great conversation and one that is super important for people to hear. So thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you for coming on. We were honored to have you here and to get to just showcase and share your insights. Thank you, Andrea and Jess. Thank you. Thank you.